Well, here we are two days before Christmas 2018. That means I get to teach about Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. The God that left his place in heaven, his throne in heaven, and even though he could have been born, he could have been born in a palace, he chose to be born in a stable, in a manger. Not even at Bethlehem Regional Hospital, could have been born there, but he chose to be born in a manger. That's why I titled this message, A Clear and Present Manger. My name is Josh. Hi, Josh. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. I like your tie. Thank you. Think baby Jesus cried when he was born? No, God wouldn't let him cry because he's too holy. So holy people don't cry? <laughs> yeah. Are you holy? Mm, well, I have a lot of holes in some of my jeans. <laughs> so I guess I'm holy then. So how long ago did Jesus live? He's still alive. How old are you? Five. How old am I? I don't know really know. Take a guess. Fifty. Oh my gosh. You know any jokes? Yes. Tell me a joke. What do you call a sheep that's covered in chocolate? I don't know. A Hershiba. <laughs> How many times have you sinned today? I don't know. How many? Three. Three? Oh dear. When was the last time you sinned? Did you know something? What? Christmas is the specialest month of them all. Why? It's because it's Jesus' birthday. <gasps> Are you serious? Really? Why is it a joyful thing that Jesus was born? Because he's like a Christmas present to all of us because he gives us um, a chance and then he'll forgive our sins. Does Jesus give you presents? Totally, yes. What does he give you? One of his most specialist ones were the Holy Spirit. And the angel said, I bring you good news of great joy. What do you think that good news was? That God is born, you should come see him. Isn't that great? Out of the mouths of babes, right? That's what the Bible says, right? Out of the mouths of babes, God has ordained praise. What is joy, right? If I was to ask you this morning, what is joy? Congregation participation time. What is joy? Give me a definition of joy. Who's got one? Knowing Emmanuel. Knowing Emmanuel very good. Okay. What? Just listening to kids talk. Especially to hear him talk about the Lord, right? What was that? That's right, that's right. Joy, that little kid said it, that God is born, you should come see him. God is born, you should come see him. So, if that is what Christmas is all about, that Jesus is a present to all of us and that salvation is... Uh, is the gift that comes through him. Why, why is it that we get all stressed out in giving gifts to other people on his birthday? How many times have you reflected on that? Like you're at the mall or you're online and you're ordering all this stuff. You go like, whose birthday is this? Right? It's interesting, interesting. Now on that topic, how many of you how many of you have uh, ever received a wrapped Christmas present, a wrapped Christmas present? You open it up, and you're thinking, now, why in the world would this person think that I would ever use this? <laughs> Raise your hands. Have you ever had one of those gifts? Somebody's giving you something like, like, come on, now. Now, here's the deal. I'm in the camp. I'm in the camp that says, it's the thought that counts. Right? It's a thought that counts, and uh, sometimes it appears that some people just don't thought all that much. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, it's like they, they remember, oh, there's somebody else that's on my list, and they're already in line, and you know, and you know that it was a last-minute impulse buy from that bin of items at Ross, you know, at the checkout stand right before you, like, like here it is, like, Soap on a rope? Hard be still. Anybody ever? Soap on a rope? Okay. One person? Nobody else? You've never got soap on a rope for Christmas? Yay! Right? 
a football phone landline. Landline. Oh, wow. How did they know? A 10-pound bag of potpourri? What are they trying to tell me, right? What are they trying to say? And then I love this one. <laughs> a Rolodex. A Rolodex. I didn't even think those made those anymore since they came out with these new things called smartphones, right? Oh, that belt. Somebody gave me a belt once, and I'm going, yeah, that belt would have fit me when I was 12, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I mean... Wearing shirts untucked, <laughs> it reveals a lot, right? Or hides a lot. Now, um, what's even worse, what's even worse when, uh, when you are, well, somebody gives you a gift. Has this ever happened to you? Somebody gives you a gift and they just stand there and wait for you to open it, right? Open it because you're, you know... <laughs> That's the expression. Have you ever made that expression? Oh, oh, a framed picture of you. What, are you a prophet? How did you know I needed that, right? Framed picture of you. Jurassic Park dinosaur slippers with the little arms on the toes. Man, I've been saving for those. Ever? <laughs> a small... <laughs> Grandmas don't get offended by this, but, uh, but grandmas don't always know what is a great gift for their grandkids. How many of you grandmas would uh, last minute give, you know, some like six-year-old a bottle of cologne from the dollar store? Oh, thanks. Oh, thanks, grandma. Or how about this one, a coffee mug with a picture of your family on it. Oh, this is a perfect gift for a single person, Right? Think I'm exaggerating a little bit? No, no well, maybe, maybe a little bit. Here's my point. This is an article that came out uh, just a few weeks back, and it stated that in America, in America, our nation, over $13 billion a year is wasted on unwanted Christmas gifts that either end up being regifted or thrown out. 56% of men and 56% uh, of women say that they have received at least one unwanted gift during the holidays. But men, men, 67% uh, more wanted uh, people to know that they just didn't, that, that was an unwanted, an unwanted gift. So ladies, you got a couple of days before Christmas, you might want to rethink those uh, SpongeBob boxer shorts, right? Why do people... Yeah, when I was four, those would have been, yeah, been great. What Americans uh, are doing with their unwanted gifts, do you know what they're doing with their unwanted gifts? I'll tell you. Survey said, survey says, survey said 29% of people just hold on to the unwanted item. You know why? In case they ever come over to your house... Right? You got to put it out there on the shelf. Yeah, you got to put it out there on the shelf. Oh, thank you. Yes, I use it. I look at it every day. And as soon as they leave, it's back in the closet, right? Till the next time, uh, till the next time they show up. 29% of people just hold on to the unwanted item, followed by 22% who exchange the gift and another 22% who plan to re-gift. Thus, what? Our white elephant party, you know, coming up in, uh, in about a week. So when asked who you'd least like to buy a present for, a whopping 30% said their boss. That's the least person. And uh, guess who the second least person was? Their mother-in-law. Their mother in -law. Ladies, don't get mad at me. I didn't make the news. I'm just... Reporting. I'm just reporting the news. Now, now, with all the time we spend feeling like we have to get some people uh, Christmas gifts, check out, check out this survey. Check out the survey that said this was the most important thing about Christmas time. 52%, 52% said spending time 
with family and loved ones. And here's something that we should all take notice of. Only 5% said that Christmas time was about the gift. But how much time do we spend chasing after all these things for other people when it's not even their birthday? You know what I mean? So, I'm thinking if we can finally learn something from another Christmas season, maybe we should focus on relationships more than gifts. And the most important relationship that we can focus on this time of year is, well, any time of year, is who? It's Jesus, right? It's, it's Jesus. Since it's Christmas, you know, it's Christ Mass. Christmas. Christ Mass. Celebration of his birth in a manger that led to his death on a cross that led to his resurrection that leads us to have the opportunity to have peace with our maker if we will what? Simply put our faith and our hope and our, uh, and our trust in him. You know, it isn't a, uh, a surprise that in today's culture, not everyone knows the real meaning, the true meaning of Christmas. So that's going to be the primary uh, topic we're going to be discussing this morning. Now, keep in mind, these crucial facts, they were all prophesied six hundred years, at least 600 years, before they came to fruition. The time that we're reading about uh, is approximately 4, approximately 4 B.C. And uh, a young Jewish girl, probably, how old do you think she is? How old do you think she is? 14, 15 years old? She's young. This 14 or 15-year-old girl, a virgin, is informed by the angel Gabriel that she will be miraculously and divinely given the privilege of giving birth to the Messiah, fulfilling the prophecy of, uh, of Isaiah 7.14. Both Mary and David come from the lineage of who? David. Of King David, right? Of King David, fulfilling Jeremiah 23.5 and Isaiah 9.7 and Isaiah 11.1. And Mary lives in what city? Nazareth. But in her third trimester, actually the end of her third trimester, Caesar Augustus mandates a sentence, and she needs to travel. You know how far it is from Nazareth to Bethlehem? It's about 70 miles. 70 miles to Bethlehem where she gives birth to Jesus, fulfilling the prophecy of Micah 5.2. Apparently there are no places to stay at the... Uh, uh, Bethlehem bed and breakfast that was there. Why? Because it's Christmas Eve. So the uh, only place available is what? A, a stable or a, or a cave? We don't know for sure. All the Bible says is that at his birth, he wasn't placed in some nice, cushy, warm incubator at uh, Bethlehem Regional Hospital. He was laid where? In a manger, in a, a feeding trough that animals would... <coughs> eat from. No sterilization, no parade, no comfort, no little warm blanket, no little beanie, you know, for his head to cover up that kind of cone-shaped head when a kid is born. No privacy. And there's Mary in all her vulnerability, giving birth, surrounded by animals and, and possibly having people walk in and out of the area. Can you imagine what that would have been like? She might have been thinking, don't mind me, I'm just, uh, I'm just giving birth to the Savior. <laughs> that's all I'm doing, just giving birth to the Savior. And that's where we're going to pick things up in our story this morning. We're going to be reading just a short portion of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. And we're going to see that uh, the first people that we're going to be introduced to are unlikely candidates to be informed of... Uh, of this miraculous event. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for just the principle of your love for us. And God, I got to believe that there are people here this morning who maybe you're not sensing 
your love completely. And I, I pray that today would be a turning point in not just their lives, but in all of our lives, that we would never look at Christmas the same. God, if there's anyone here who has basically always celebrated a Santa Christmas and not a Jesus Christmas, I pray that this would be the first year that they actually understand that they have a Savior. They have a Savior. And that their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen? Amen? All right, so Luke, Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Let's pick things up in verse 8. I'm going to read verses 8 through 16. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were greatly afraid. Look at verse 10. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to how many people? All. To all people, right? To all people. Verse 11. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying where? In a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into uh, heaven that the shepherds, the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem. Let us see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. If you don't have a Bible with you, you're going to want to follow along with us. So there's the overview. Here we're going to fill in a, uh, a couple of blanks. A couple of blanks. Look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. So in the preceding verses, Luke has told us that uh, Mary and Joseph had already made this 70-mile this trek from Nazareth to Bethlehem for the census. And by the, time they, uh, by the time they get to the city, what happens? The local Motel 6 was full, and they were given a place to stay uh, that night in a stable or a cave somewhere near there. And then the scene does what? It switches from this birthplace of our Savior to, uh, to a bunch of shepherds that are tending their flocks in the fields. Look at verse 9. The Bible says, And behold, an angel, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. You know, I don't, I don't blame them for being greatly afraid because they, they probably didn't see angels shoning around them every day. This is probably something... New, not something they're seeing on a regular basis. Look at verse 10. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you what? Good tidings of great joy. Of great joy, which will be, again, to all people. Those are some of the most comforting words, right? Some of the most comforting words we can ever hear. Don't be afraid. Then the angel tells them the reason why there's no need to fear because he brings good tidings, good news, right? Good news of great joy. And who does he bring this good news to? It says all people, right? It says all people, all people. How many people are on the planet right now? 7.4 billion people on the planet. And all people have access to this joy, this love, this forgiveness, and this incredible relationship. 
And if there's anything that this world needs today, it's, it's joy. Look at verse 11. Luke chapter 2, verse 11. It says, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. When you were out doing your, uh, your Christmas shopping, right, how many of you saw some, uh, some swaddling clothes on sale when you were at uh, the Rushmore Mall? Maybe. Maybe not, right? Yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. Swaddling clothes, you probably don't even know what they are. They're just little, they're little strips of linen wrapped around the baby to keep them warm. And, uh, and the manger, you know this, the manger, it was just a, a, a feeding trough for animals. I bet you Mary didn't wipe it down with Purell or, or, uh, or Clorox wipes. Remember, Mary's delivery room wasn't some cushy OR in the Bethlehem City Regional Hospital. It was a stable, a nasty, dirty, smelly, noisy stable. Now, have you ever thought about why Jesus was born in such uh, lowly, humble conditions? That's exactly right. You know, it's because he came to be humble. You know, he had the right to be born in a beautiful palace to a, to a family of wealth and power. But he chose to, came in, to come into the world, to come into the world the same way that we did, naked and vulnerable and externally average. And I think the purpose of that is so it would be easy for us to be able to, to relate to him. So these are, uh, these are not ideal conditions for having a baby. And I don't know if you heard about this. This just happened a couple of weeks back. Very, a very pregnant, soon-to-be mom goes into labor, jumps in the car, dashes to the hospital. But as it happens, she gets a craving for some food. But this time, it's not pickles and ice cream. It's Taco Bell. I'm not making it up. It's not Taco Bell. So as soon as she pulls in the driveway, the baby says, I'm not letting you put that stuff in me, and just kind of slides out the chute pretty quick, right there, right there in the parking lot at Taco Bell. Can you picture the scene? Honey, I'm having contractions, and I could give birth at any moment, so we need to get to the hospital. But can we stop by and get me a chalupa and some nachos on the way? Right after the delivery, Child Protective Services showed up and confiscated the baby, telling the mom, under these circumstances, we have decided that's nacho baby. <laughs> I'm just seeing if you're still awake. Okay, hey, stop groaning. It's, it's the... It's a Christmas message. Can't groan at a Christmas message. Let's move on. That's not your baby. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> so like this gal, like this gal we just read about, Mary. Mary, her delivery conditions were not, uh, not ideal. Back to the story. Did you notice? Look at verse 11 again. Look at verse 11. It said that he was born Savior, Christ, and Lord, right? Savior Christ and Lord. He was born Savior. I want you to think about this. He was born Savior, which means deliverer or rescuer, and that he alone had the ability to forgive us from sin and the guilt and the shame and the separation from God that our sin has caused. That's what the Bible says, that there is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and our sin has separated us have separated us from our Creator. Number two, he was born Christ, which means literally, it means anointed one. And it is the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew word what? Messiah, or in Hebrew it's Mashiach, right? Mashiach, and it refers to the prophecy of his lineage being from King David and that his rule would be forever. His rule would be forever. And then he was born what? Lord. He was born Lord. The Greek word, kurios. Look at the person next to you and say, kurios. Look at that. Speaking Greek already. Kurios. 
meaning master or owner. And uh, the root form of this word, it means supremacy or to be supreme. So uh, the next time you go to Taco Bell, speaking of Taco Bell, so the next time you go to Taco Bell, order a burrito curios, right? And then explain to them that curios means uh, supreme. So just you're picturing the scene, ordering a, a burrito supreme. Use the Greek. Use the Greek. Uh, and they're probably going to think that you're pretty smart. Pretty smart. And it could lead to a witnessing opportunity. Or they could think you're crazy and call the police, <laughs> leading to another witnessing <laughs> opportunity. Either way, you get to tell somebody about Jesus. Back to the story. Once again, uh, the shepherds, they receive, they receive an angel, Graham, that the Messiah is to be born in what city? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. So they hoofed it down to the city. They meet their Savior. And not only their Savior, their God, because, you realize this, Joseph, Joseph, uh, he also received an angel, Graham, by Gabriel, who told him that this child's name would be... Betty Ann got this earlier, right? Emmanuel. Emmanuel, which means... God with us, fulfilling the prophecy. Remember the prophecy of Isaiah 714. Again, that's 700 years before his birth. 714, let's read this together. What does it say? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So Gabriel has said that this baby will carry the title Emmanuel, God with us, God with us, the eternal word of God. Again, during our, our prayer time before uh, the service started, I, 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 all week I've been thinking about this, that in John 1 it says, in the the beginning was the Word, and do you ever think about that? He's eternally been the Word of God, and he took on an additional nature. He took on the nature of a little tiny baby for the singular purpose of, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. There is no other way to reconcile sinful man to a holy, to a holy God. The eternal word of God. God the Son has left his throne in heaven, humbled himself to take on human flesh, lived a sinless life, declared the separation between God and man due to man's sin, and that forgiveness of sin would be possible by the shedding of blood of the sinless Lamb of God. Then Jesus would allow himself to be crucified once again by sinful men, right? By sinful men. And he'd be raised from the dead on the third day. Why? Because God desires all people to live eternally with him. Simply acknowledging their sin, turning from it, and live a life in personal relationship with, with their creator. You know, I went, I went 32 years without somebody telling me that my sin would keep me from going to heaven and that my sin would keep me from having personal relationship with the God that created me. I don't follow his commands because I have to. I follow his commands because I love him, because he first loved me, and he chose me before I chose him. It's a very simple process. You don't have to uh, go knock on doors. You don't have to go through a catechism class. You just have to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and allow him to rule and reign in your heart. Look at verse 13, Luke chapter 2. Verse 13, it says, And suddenly there was with the angel 
a multitude, a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. I want you to picture that in your mind. What kind of, what kind of heavenly choir would that have looked like? What if it was every angel in heaven, every angel, millions and millions, busting out in praise and worship? Glory to God in the highest. That just means that he is praised in the heavenlies. Praise in the heavenlies. All heaven declares the praises of God. But ironically, here on earth, many, including me back in the day, used to use his name as a cuss word. His name is praised in all, in all of heaven. But it's used as a curse word here. What else is promised here in this verse? It says, peace on earth. Don't you think peace is what this world needs right now? Peace is what the world needed then. It's what the world needs now. Now, don't raise your hands, right? Don't raise your hands on this. But how many of us have been tempted to let our, uh, our peace get robbed, our peace get robbed uh, during this particular season? Peace is not an easy thing, right? Not an easy thing to come by especially for you parents. Had a call, had a call from uh, one of you moms the other day who said in a hushed tone, she says, Greg, will you pray for me? I am in desperate need of some peace and quiet. <laughs> and I said, I said, sure, sure, I would love to, but, but why are you whispering? And she said, because I'm hiding from my kids. <laughs> because I'm hiding from my kids. And she said, and then I said, well, well, I can hear them. I can hear them in the background. Where are you hiding? And she said, I'm in the pantry. <laughs> I'm in the pantry. And I said, uh, I said, well, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to say when they find you? And she said, I'm going to tell them that this is mommy's prayer pantry. <laughs> this is mommy's prayer pantry. You moms deserve a medal. You moms deserve a medal for having patience with your kids. How do you live your life in the fast lane and remain sane, not losing your brain when your kids are a drain, raising cane, yanking your chain, causing you pain, almost blowing a vein in your membrane? <laughs> Refrain from disdain, remembering that godliness with contentment is great gain when you let Jesus reign. There you go. P. Diddy gave me that. No, he didn't give that to me. All right. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, right? How great it would be if P. Diddy was writing that kind of stuff. That would be awesome. Pray for those guys. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And his peace is is available to anyone who will choose to love him back. Anyone. Boggles my mind that people will reject him because this is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says according to, uh, to Romans. Let's read this. Can you read that? Let's read this together. It says, this is Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. It says, therefore, having been, everybody, justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2. Through whom... Also, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Amen. Doesn't that just make you go, there's no weight on us. Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That is the offer, right? That is the offer that Jesus makes to everyone. Man cannot have genuine lasting peace until they are submitted to the God that created them and who refers to himself as the prince of peace, right? The prince of peace. Our own sin is our barrier to peace, and that's why we need a savior because we can't save 
ourselves. This peace is not only necessary in the Christmas season, it's necessary when? All the time, right? It's necessary all the time. And here's the deal. If you don't have this peace this morning, I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end of this message is to invite this Prince of Peace to take the reins of your life. I was sharing the gospel with a gal once and, uh, and, and she said, Greg, uh, you said that you want me to allow God to control my life. And I said, well, I didn't use that word control. I used the word care because we don't need anybody else controlling us, right? We've had so many people that try to control us. Bad relationships, bad bosses, bad churches. You know, God doesn't control us. We have a free will, but God cares for us. Surrender your care to him. So we've read up to this point that the birth of Jesus is about bringing joy to the world. How? We're told that answer in, in uh in Matthew's <clears throat> gospel, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it says, and, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, right? Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. There's nothing more important to any person on this planet than to know that they can be saved from the penalty of their sins. You know, we've all lied. We've all stolen something. We've all taken the Lord's name in vain. We've all not honored God, put him first. We've all made some kind of little idol in our life. You've lusted after somebody. That's what God calls adultery, committing adultery in your heart. You know, uh, we've all coveted. We've broken all the, that's just the first 10, right? <laughs> They're just, just the first 10. I need help. I need help. The first time that was explained to me, I go, well, I've done a lot more than that. I need Jesus. I want to go to heaven, and I want to have his peace. I want to have his peace now. And all we have to do is turn from our sin and turn to behaviors that please our God, and we receive his forgiveness. And, and he promises us eternal life, but he also promises us abundant life now. Abundant life. What does that look like? It says, even in the midst of the storm, don't raise your hands, but all of us are going through a storm right now in our lives on some level. But it doesn't mean the cessation of a storm or a trial or a tribulation in your life. It just means that, that Jesus is in the boat with us. And he's going to get us to the other side. He says that I hold you with, with my righteous right hand. And he'll let us pull our hand out of his, but he will never, he will never let go of us. Look at verse 14. The true meaning of Christmas. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So if that, if that is the true meaning of Christmas, how did we allow the day that we set aside to celebrate our Savior's, our Savior's birth, how in the world have we allowed that to instead of bringing him the gift, right, the gift of our, of our praise and our thanksgiving and our, and our loving him with our entire lives, how did we allow that to be turned into a day where we give gifts to one another with very little discussion of Jesus at all? Now, here's the deal. I don't, I don't bring that up to make us feel bad because all of us have probably gotten consumed by the consumerism, Right? of Christmas. So I don't bring that up to make us feel bad, just to open our eyes of what Jesus is really trying to, to speak to our hearts. And he wants us to celebrate him. Just celebrate him. And I, uh, I have a couple of minute video here that will, that will hopefully drive that, uh, that point home. something? So I'm wondering if I could borrow your phone or... 
Yeah. Yep. Yeah, of course. Yeah, mm-hmm. come on in. Um, I'm Claire. This is Jeremy. I'm Jesus. What? I'm Jesus. Oh my god. Yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> I like that. It's like you guys are having a party or something. Oh, yeah. It's, um, we're Christmas decorating. We do this every year. It's December 25th. We celebrate Jesus's Your birthday. Day. Okay. <clears throat> What's with the, uh, the tree? Oh, the tree, it's, um... What's with the tree? The tree... Well, you see, the tree is like... it's like Are those hidden... presents for me? No. 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 <laughs> I thought you said it was my birthday. Yes. We, we, I, we did. We did say, we did say that. Uh, but uh, those presents are not for you. Oh. Yeah. Who are they for? Us. Us. <laughs> so you guys got each other presents for my birthday. Yeah, yeah. It's, it does sound a little weird when you um when you say that loud. Went with the animal socks. Oh, so those are those are stockings uh, mm-hmm. for Santa to fill. Who's Santa? Uh, he's he's this big kind of jolly guy wears a red suit. Just like a part of the just part of the Christmas culture, you know, mm-hmm. comes down the chimney. It's it's tradition. Just, does he go through the glass? It's not a metaphor. He's not real. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Okay. But. The socks are for him to fill up. We we, we fill, fill them. Up. Up. We fill them up. Okay, so you guys fill the socks and then pretend that Santa did it. Yes. <laughs> oh. I could probably get a phone somewhere else. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All That's right. Probably a good idea. Okay. Oh. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for having me. Oh, what did I see you out? Okay. <laughs> Bless you. Awesome. Okay. Gonna take a while, so you might want to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, kind of a humorous way to make us look differently at uh, at what is probably reality. Very often, newsflash wasn't a real video. Those were those were uh, just actors. But but surprise, right? Surprise. But what if it was real? What if it was real? What if Jesus showed up in the flesh and said to you, uh, hey, uh, what's with the tree? And what's with the animal socks? And uh, what's with Santa? And then asked, uh, are those presents for me? I thought you said it was my birthday, right? I thought you said it was my birthday. So you got each other presents for my birthday. What would you say? What would you say? What could we say? Here's a heart-searching question. Every year, okay, on three, I want you to yell out your birthday. Uh, uh, one, two, three. Some of you aren't playing, okay? Uh, one, two, okay, I'll give you to four. Maybe you need four, okay? Uh, yell out your birthday, okay? One, two, three, four. May 27th. Okay. See? Very good. All right. Now, every year, who do you share your birthday with? You. You do? Well, you do? Excellent. Man, I'm going to be receiving gifts all year long then, huh? I like that. But who do you share? You don't share your birthday. You don't want to share your birthday with anyone. So here's the deal, kind of practically. Why should Jesus share his birthday with anyone, right? The day that we celebrate his birth. Do you share your birthday with uh, a jolly old fat guy who always wears the same clothes and lives at the North Pole? No. So why should Jesus share his birthday with a fictitious fat guy that has reindeer-powered flying sleds and uses servant labor to make his toys? I bet you Santa doesn't even pay a minimum wage, right? Now, I see those little bubbles over your head that says, sounds like Greg's got Santa issues, right? (laughs) Sounds like Greg has Santa issues. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. I'm not Santa claustrophobic. Get it? Claustrophobic, yeah. I'm not a Santa hater. Here's the deal. I'm a Jesus lover. Not a Santa hater. I'm just a Jesus lover. And since it's our Lord's birthday, 
why not leave the fat guy out of it completely? Why not? Why not? Come on, Greg. Are you saying that Santa is dangerous? Harmless old Kris Kringle. Never cuts his hair. Trims his beard. Changes his clothes. Leaves his house only once a year. At night. <laughs> to break into other people's houses. <laughs> so living at the North Pole for a reason. That guy is running from something. I'm telling you. I know enough people like that. Used to be one, right? And then there's his uh, red nose and cheeks like we used to all get after an all-night bender, you know, of, of partying. I'm just stating the obvious. Come on, Greg, old St. Nick. He ain't hurting nobody. Why get our knickers in a twist over Christmas? I think that's a fair question. I do. I do. I think it's a fair question. But here's a better fair question. If the fat dude is taking our eyes off of the real reason for Christmas, which is the celebration of the birth of Jesus, the Savior we profess, is the fat guy harmless? Here's a truth bomb for you. What generation in your family is going to finally stop the cycle of untruth and start teaching that Christmas is only about one person and his name is Jesus. Why can't it be you? Why can't it be your generation? Okay, Greg, I'm, uh, I'm, I think I'm picking up what you're laying down here, right? What you're saying makes logical sense, but Greg, it's, it's two days. It is two days before what? Christmas. And Santa is already everywhere in our house. He's on the gift paper. He's on the ornaments. He and Frosty and Rudolph are like the three amigos, you know, on the mantle, right next to the elf on the shelf. Is there anything we can redeem from the fat guy? I think there is. I think there is. We can remind our kids that the fat dude borrowed the idea of the naughty and nice list from Jesus. And if we're nice, God promises us abundant life now and everlasting life in eternity if we will simply what? Choose to follow him. I think you probably notice that, uh, that this morning in our time of worship, Jingle Bells wasn't there. A holy jolly Christmas wasn't there. Even Jingle Bell Rock wasn't there. Not even Grandma got run over by a reindeer, right? <laughs> it's not a very nice Christmas song, right? It wasn't there. All I'm saying, all I'm saying is that for the Christian, church shouldn't be the only place where Santa isn't exalted and Jesus is. I, I tell you all this time, just pray through it. Just ask Jesus. I bet you, you probably haven't asked him that. All your decorating that you did this year. Did you ask Jesus? Hey, are you cool with this? Is this good? Is this good? Look at verse 15 before everybody gets all convicted. I don't want to. Okay, maybe I want you to be a little bit convicted, but, but uh, don't beat yourself up over it. Just do the right thing. Look at verse 15. Luke chapter 2, verse 15. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and they found Mary, right? They found Mary and Joseph and a babe lying in a manger. That must have been a big manger for them all to have been in there, but uh, just kidding. It was just Jesus. As I remember, I think I'm the only one old enough to remember what that looked like. So these shepherds, these shepherds think it should be easy to find a newborn laying in an animal feeding trough. And they do. And did you notice that these guys don't dilly-dally? They head straight to Bethlehem. And they find the child just as the angel 
told them, laying there in a clear and present manger. God uses very ordinary people and very ordinary things to do very extraordinary tasks. Mary was an ordinary, a godly, but an ordinary girl. Joseph was a godly, but ordinary, right? Ordinary man. Just a carpenter from Nazareth. And an ordinary feeding trough to be the place where the Son of God would be laying. Now, I'm not sure that if uh, Mary was sending out invitations for her guest list of first visitors, it would have been this group of shepherds. She probably looked at her husband and whispered, did you invite these guys, <laughs> right? Did you, did you invite these guys? And Joe said, hey, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Now, it's not just these guys, you know, uh, not just that they were strangers, it's that shepherds, shepherds, they weren't real well liked. They weren't allowed anywhere near the temple. They were, uh, they were known as, as, as thieves and malcontents. They were known as, as pickpockets, kind of like the, the first century gypsies. And uh, when there were shepherds around, people locked their doors and hid their children. But as it turns out, in God's economy, that these were the first visitors of the Messiah. That just boggles my mind. Now, now I had intended to stop here at, uh, at verse 16 so I could fit in my, you know, creative sermon title, A Clear and Present Manger. But it wasn't just that these guys showed up and, uh, and checked out the king in the crib. Look what they did next. Look what they did next. Look at verse 17. Now, when they had seen him, they made widely known the sayings which was told them concerning this child. Look at verse 18. And all those who heard it marveled at those things that were told to them by the shepherds. These shepherds were some of the first evangelists to share the good news. Why is that important? Because the... These weren't seminary-trained people. They didn't have degrees in theology. They weren't of the priestly class of Levi. These were just normal men who met the Lord, and they immediately went out and told others, regardless of what some might have thought. Isn't that what keeps us from sharing the gospel with people? We're concerned about what other people think instead of being concerned about what Jesus thinks. And Jesus told us to go. They were just normal guys. They knew it. Think about it. These, are, these, these shepherds have reputations of not telling the truth. And they're going around, and they're telling people, hey, the Messiah has born. Well, 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 where is he? Is he in a palace? Where is he? No, he's in a cave. Well, in a manger. And what happens when the shepherds got to the part about the multitude of angels? Bet you the town folks were sniffing to see their breath, right, or smell their breath. These guys have been drinking, man. These guys have been hitting their schnapps. But uh, it just amazes me. In God's economy, these are the perfect, imperfect people to use to preach the good news. Look at the person next to you and say, if God can use them, he can use me. Look at you, can't even say that in church. Say it bold, right? If God can use them, he can use me, right? Of course, of course. That is what God has done just now. He used uh, an everyday schmo. If you would have known me back in my teen years and my 20s, I would have been the most leak... Uh, if you would have known me in, in, in my teen years or my 20s, even my early 30s, 
you would have looked at the way I live my life and that I would be the least likely person that God would ever use to be up here sharing the gospel with, uh, with you. But he does that. He uses everyday schmoes to share. The, look at the person next to you and say, I'm kind of an everyday schmo. And then look at them back at the other and said, you are too. You're kind of a schmo, right? So here, as we're wrapping things up here for this morning, the message of Christmas is a message of God's love. If you got that, it's a message of God's love resulting in, in hope and mercy and God's grace, his forgiveness of sins. Christmas isn't about the gift under the tree. Christmas is about the gift that hung on the tree. Which category, right? Which category do you fall into this morning? I, I've told you this before. Hopefully, you guys have picked up on it because I stole it from somebody else. But, uh, but I, I'm constantly asking people, wherever, are you celebrating a Santa Christmas or a Jesus Christmas? It gets the conversation rolling to start talking about the real reason for the season. And, and some people would be honest and say, well, I think up to this point, it's been more of a Santa Christmas. But I, I understand what you're saying. It's all about, it's all about Jesus. What will Tuesday morning, what will Tuesday morning look like in your house? doesn't matter what you've prepared for up to this point. What's it actually going to look like this Tuesday morning? Are you going to slow your roll? Are you going to set your priorities in place? Are you actually going to talk about the one who hung on the tree before you open the gifts that are under the tree? What a teachable moment. Man, I so wish that my parents would have done that with me. What, what could that have changed? What could that have changed in my life? I don't know. What a teachable moment for your kids to remind them that this day is not about gifts. It's about the gift, right? Right? It's about the gift that God wrapped in humanity in swaddling clothes in a clear and present manger who lived that sinless life, allowed himself to be crucified in our place, who rose from the dead on the third day. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father. Why did he do that? To save his people from their sins? That's the question. Those of you here, those that are listening by radio, those who will listen to this, uh, this message uh, either on our YouTube channel or, or in a CD, have you, that's the question, have you been saved from the penalty of your sins? Being in church, that says something but that doesn't make you a Christian. Christian, little Christ, follower of Christ. That's what the word means. Have you been saved from the penalty of your sins? Or are you going to die in your sins and not go to heaven? That's the easy, easy understanding that a lot of people don't want to say. I'm encouraging everyone to receive the gift that leads to eternal life. Have you bent your knee? to the God in the manger. As of, uh, here's one, as of this very moment, if I were to talk to the people that are closest to you, would they say that your life reflects Jesus Christ and that your life revolves around him and that you live your life to please him? That's what it means to be a Christian. And if not, it's accepting Christ is so easy. Don't have to take a test. You just have to go through the ABCs of salvation. A is just simply you need to admit, right? 
Admit that you've sinned. I don't know why that's so difficult for people. All I have to do is call your moms. They'll tell me. Right? We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Surprise. Okay? But yet, Jesus knew that in advance when we were created. All we need to do is receive his forgiveness. And that, just believe, believe not only that Jesus died because he so loved the world, but he died for you. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. In the one who gave himself for me. That's what Paul says, gave himself for me. Died for me. That's until, until you get past that, yeah, he, maybe he died for all these other people. No, he died for you. He died for you. He died for you and you and you and you. And then we just need to confess that Jesus is Lord. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from the penalty of your sin. And it's not you trying to work out some religious list of do's and don'ts. It's an inside job by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Just gently prodding us and reminding us that, oh, I've got something better for you. Do this, don't do that but he'll never beat you up over it. So this morning, I'm just going to give you that opportunity. And you've got a relatively thorough gospel presentation. You understand that Jesus didn't have to do what he did, but because he loves you, he left his throne in eternity and he came to earth, born in a nasty old manger, something like that, to pay the penalty for your sins and for mine. Just amazes me, and I wish I would have surrendered my heart to him so much sooner, but you have an opportunity to now. So let's pray. Father, thank you for these precious men and women that you have brought here this morning. And God, everybody here, they look like a Christian. I don't know what a Christian looks like on the outside. Man looks at the outside, God looks at the heart. And, and God, I am praying, I am praying that you would uh, just gently knock on the door of every person's heart and ask for permission to come in because that doorknob is on the inside of our heart, not the outside. We're the only ones that can open that. That's why you've given us a free will. So whether it's a first-time commitment to Jesus or you are recognizing that uh, my hand has not been to the plow, yes, I know that my name is written in his book and I haven't kept my part of the covenant, but I know that Jesus has. Maybe you need to once and for all completely surrender everything to him. So in the privacy of your heart, that's you, either you've never given your heart to Christ or you feel distant from him right now, just in the privacy of your heart, just pray something simple like this. It doesn't have to be these exact words, but just from the condition of your heart, just from what your heart is telling you right now about your need for him, just say, Jesus, this morning, I, I, I get it. I get it. I don't have to earn your love. There's nothing I could do to earn your love. I, I get, it's a free gift. And God, I, I don't even really know what love is. I've been hurt. I've been wounded. I've been mistreated so many times. And, and yet I know, I know that you will never hurt me. And you will never abandon me. And you will never tell me I'm ugly or I'm fat or I'm worthless or I have no value. You're going to tell me the exact opposite of that. You're going to tell me that I am your pearl of great price. You're going to tell me that I am your special treasure. You're going to tell me that I was worth the shedding of your blood on the cross. That's how much you loved me. And so I get it this morning, God. I, I need you. I need this kind of peace that only you can offer. 
And I'm asking this morning, God, that uh, you'd hear my heart as I tell you, I know that I've sinned. I might not have sinned as much as Bible boy did, but, uh, but I know that I've sinned, and I know that my sin has separated me from you. And this morning, God, I, uh, I want my name written in your book. I want to know that I know that I know that I am your child. And so today, God, I, I, I am doing that. I am, I, am, I am surrendering the reins of my life to you. All my cares, all my concerns, all my problems, all my hurts, all my pain, I'm surrendering to you once and for all. I've tried it my way, and it just hasn't worked. And God, I'm thankful that you will, you will never reject a broken and a contrite spirit. And I'm thankful, God, that you promise that you will separate my sins as far as east is from west. So today, God, you see that I am kneeling in my heart to you. I'm reaching my hand to yours because your hand is already outstretched to me. And I am going to allow you to make the changes that are necessary so that I can reflect you as a blood-bought, blood-washed, born-again child of the Most High God. I pray this uh, in your name. And still with our, our heads bowed um, and our eyes closed, uh, I want to get some materials into your hands that will help you in your walk with the Lord. So if you just prayed that prayer either as a first-time commitment or as a... Uh, uh, a recommitment of your life to Christ. I want to be able to just uh, to get you some materials after church. So just uh, slip up your hand just so I, I can know who that was. Who? Who was that? Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay. All right. Father, you know those people that have just sensed their need for you this morning. And I would pray, God, that they would realize that, that your mercy endures forever and that your love endures forever and that you have the ability to make all things new. Let that be our hope. Let there be, be our hope at Christmas and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, there's your story of the manger, and, and I pray it has brand new significance in your heart and that, that Christmas will no longer be about the fat guy. It'll only be about our opportunity to glorify the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. How great is it that God chose the lowest guys on the totem pole of the social scale, the shepherds, to be the first evangelists? And if God can use them, he can use you and I. So this week, let's go out and share the gospel, the gospel of good tidings and peace to anyone who will choose Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Hey, and if you don't mind, will you uh, click that link below and there's a bell there also. Hit that and we'll make sure to notify you next time we have a video available. Not only Merry Christmas, happy birthday to Jesus.